We give because someone gave to us. We give because nobody gave to us. We give because giving has changed us. We give because giving could have changed us. You gave me what you did not have. I gave you what I had to give, and together we made something greater from the difference. So much of what matters in our lives began with a gift. The love that we receive from our families and friends and communities is a gift offered to us that we can't put a price on, that we can never truly repay. The time and attention that's invested in us by our teachers, by our mentors and our peers who sat patiently with us as we learned and made mistakes and fell short of our aspirations and learned once more is a gift offered to us that we cannot put a price on, that we can never truly repay. The resources that have made our lives possible, the food and the drink and the shelter and the clothing and the books and the toys and the experiences we were given as children, these were gifts that were offered to us, gifts whose cost might be calculated but who are priceless nonetheless, gifts that we can never truly repay. So, and friends, I take, invite you to take a moment now, whether you're here together in the sanctuary, whether you're with us on Zoom, maybe close your eyes, maybe soften your gaze, and think about someone, just one person, who's given you one of those life-changing gifts, love, time, resources, just one person. Bring that person to your mind's eye. Those of you on Zoom, I invite you to type into the chat who came to mind for you. And those of you who are here, I invite you to call out who came to mind for you. I'll repeat into the microphone from both sides. Katie, my mom, my mom, Hannah, Hannah. Tracy and Ginger. Feel free to call them out loud in the sanctuary. Rosemary, Stan, my sister, Aaron, who's like a dad to me, Jeff, my grandmother, Doris, Ken. The gifts that these people gave us are priceless. We can never truly repay these people. But how many of you, when you think of that person that came to mind for you, when you think of that person, how many of you have found that you've been inspired by that person to give to another in your life? I'm seeing a lot of nodding in the sanctuary. How about you on, on Zoom? Has that person inspired you to give? Yeah, yeah. We want a loving parent. We want to become a loving parent because our parents were loving. We wanted to become a teacher because we had a teacher who changed our lives. We work in medicine because we lost someone early in life and someone else shepherded us through that process. When we reflect upon these gifts that have been given, we can't help but feel that spirit of generosity ourselves, right? Are you, do you feel generous when you think of that person who comes to mind for you, the person who gave to you? Yeah. We give because someone gave to us. We give because giving changed us. I think of my youth advisors when I was a young person in Unitarian Universalism who saw me fully for who I was and invited me into leadership. Their giving changed me. What's even more incredible than these wonderful people who gave to us is that the opposite is also true, right? 
We give because someone gave to us, but we also give because nobody gave to us. We give because giving changed us, but we also give because we know that giving could have changed us, but it wasn't there. And so again, I invite you to take a moment to look inward. Think of a need you had in your life that went unmet. And I know this can be painful, so be gentle with yourself. It doesn't have to be the most big, hurtful need. What is a need that happened in your life that went unmet? This is probably a harder question. It's a question that touches our hurts, a vulnerable question. But if you feel moved to share what that unmet need was that came to mind for you, I invite you again to speak it aloud into the sanctuary or type it in the chat. Trust and safety, understanding, peace, support, friendship, needs that went unmet. We maybe needed a safe home as a child, or we needed someone who believed in us when we lost faith in ourselves. We needed someone to offer us unconditional love rather than love that had strings attached to it. Or we needed to be told that who we are is beloved and whole and holy, even if we are wounded, even if we are queer, even if so much of the world is oppressive to us. So when you reflected on that unmet need that came to mind for you, friends, how many of you found one of those unmet needs at the root of some important gift that you are now offering to the world? Did any of you find that? Yeah, a lot of us. How about on Zoom? Unmet needs spurred your giving in some other way. Yeah, yeah. Studies have shown that a large number, likely a significant majority of mental health professionals enter the field at least in part because they're moved by their own or their family's psychological issues or vulnerabilities or pain. The LGBTQ community puts radical welcome and support of young queer people at the center of our activism because of how few of us received that support when we were young queer people. I became a minister, at least in part, because I wanted to serve a congregation that could make space for young people, for people of color, not just for one identity of Unitarian Universalist, but for all of the identities of people who find in this faith a home. Because I couldn't find that community when I needed it. We give because someone gave to us. We give to honor the generosity of those who came before. And what's incredible about the choice that's open to us as human beings is that we also give because no one gave to us. We also have the chance in our lives to flip the script. And instead of being stingy with others because the world has not been generous with us, we have the ability to choose instead to be radically generous with others so that they don't have to feel the pain of unmet need in the same way that we once did. And I know that this is hard work. Those of us who feel those unmet needs and even who centered our careers on meeting those unmet needs for other people, we know that we often have to do significant healing around our own pain to be able to give freely to others, right? It's not like it's easy. But my friends, it can happen. It happens every day. It happens in the lives of a number of people who are here at this moment. Maybe in all of our lives who are here gathered together at this moment, or even watching this service on YouTube in the future. It's hard, but it's a miracle that it can happen in human community. We can choose to flip that script. We need not be imprisoned by the bitterness that we feel by our own unmet needs. Instead, we can choose to be liberated through the act of generosity to another. 
We give because our giving has changed us. We have give because giving could have changed us. And so today, as we mentioned earlier in the service, we begin our annual stewardship campaign for the 2023 year. This is when we invite each other to reflect on what this community means to us, on how it changes our lives, how it enables us to create change in the wider world. And we make a decision about how, we can, how much we can offer financially to this congregation. We know that each of us have different financial means. We can't all give the same amount. And some of us have in hu huge financial struggles in this community. Some of us have huge financial means in this community. That question does not have the same answer for each one of us, nor should it in a community that welcomes diversity of experience. But when we share these decisions with the congregation, whatever generosity means for you, it allows our leaders to plan for how we can live out the mission in the coming year and make informed choices for our budget. That's why it's important to the congregation. We're not a congregation that receives funds from on high, unfortunately. All that we use to carry out what we do comes from what we raise together amongst us alongside a small amount from our endowment fund and the rental income we receive from our community partners as we share this building as a way of using our living our values in the wider world. But what we raise from the congregation makes up the biggest chunk of the budget by far and costs have risen with inflation and with hybrid services. Um, calling us to be able to do more for one another and build a community together that we've never really done before. So this year, our campaign theme is change makers across the ages as we reflect on those throughout our history and in our current life who have found that the First Unitarian Church not only changes their lives for the better, but that the First Unitarian Church is a place that helps us to be better agents of change in the world and in the lives of those that we love. And I know that every time I gather with this community, whether we're in an evening ministry meeting on Zoom where we're all wearing sweatpants and eating our dinner after a long day of work or school or childcare or managing our own healthcare challenges, when we gather like that or when we gather in this uh, hulking, uh, muscular Victorian sanctuary, and I'm wearing my fancy robe and my fancy stole and lipstick, whether we gather in casual ways, in formal ways, every time I gather with you, I think of those change makers who came before us, who made a space for the role that I play here, who made a welcome for the role that each one of us plays here. This community is 226 years old, my friends. We are the oldest church that's always called itself Unitarian in the United States. And it has survived and thrived and transformed the world because of those who have entered into it, who have found something that nourished their souls here, that have found others who shared their values and celebrated and mourned with them and brought them soup when they were sick. This community devoted to awakening love and justice in our lives and in the world grows because we give ourselves to each other here because we give ourselves to our mission, because we find that this place helps us to create greater change in the world than we could create alone. How many of you feel like you can create a better change in the world because of this community? Anyone here and on Zoom? Oh my gosh, almost every hand of a non-visitor for the first time was raised in the sanctuary. How about you on Zoom? Yeah. Yeah, it nourishes our souls, it helps us become better people, and we organize together, together for greater change. Today, one of the people that is one of the most powerful change makers in our history, Francis Ellen Watkins Harper, whose words we used in our call to worship, is on my mind. So last Saturday would have marked the 197th birthday for Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. She was born in Maryland. And I just want to, for those of you who don't know her or who like hearing about her always, which I do, <laughs> just share an outline of what her life was like. She was born as a free black woman in Maryland in 1825. She lost both of her parents by age three. And so she was raised by her aunt and uncle, Henrietta and William Watkins. 
and had the luck of her uncle being an outspoken abolitionist and an organizer of a black literary society and the leader of a school called the Watkins Academy for Negro Youth. And so she went to that school and received an education, which was not something to be taken for granted for black people, even free black people at that time. She finished school at age 13, which was what was expected, and became a nursemaid and a seamstress. But she wrote her first volume of poetry by age 21. She was the first woman instructor at Union Seminary, which was a school for free African Americans in Ohio. And shortly after becoming a teacher in her mid-20s, her home state of Maryland passed a law that free African Americans living in the North were no longer allowed to enter the state without being imprisoned and sold back into slavery. And so though she was born in that state as a free woman, they passed a law that if she ever returned home, she would be imprisoned and enslaved. And she was 26. So she began working against slavery. And she moved in with abolitionists and Underground Railroad leaders William and Letitia George, still here in Philadelphia. She started writing poetry. She became a traveling lecturer on the anti-slavery circuit. In 1866, in her early 40s, she spoke to the National Women's Rights Convention in New York with those words that I shared earlier. We are all bound up together, calling for the women's rights movement to include African-American women in their fight for suffrage. And she became a pivotal leader for inter what we now call intersectionality at that time the intersectionality of voting rights, not just voting rights for white women, which was a movement, or voting rights for black men, which was a movement, but voting rights for everybody with both movements supporting the other one, which was not happening very well at that time. In 1870, she chose to join this church, and she held dual membership, I believe, for the rest of her life with the um, Mother Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church across town, which at that point was basically across the street from us. She held dual membership with the tradition of her childhood, an AME church, which at the time and is still now one of the main organizing communities for blacks in this city, especially blacks at the time working against slavery and then working for voting rights. Dual membership with that congregation and with this congregation, which was a mostly white congregation devoted to a different theology. At the time, it would have been a Christian theology speaking to the unity of God, the importance of using human reason and honoring lived experience as sacred text, and yet also a community whose values of justice and equity and compassion in human relations called it to work against slavery, called it to work for voting rights for women and for black people amongst other civil rights. She was a change maker. She used her powers of language in writing poems and essays and short stories and novels, being one of the first black women to have her writings published in the United States. And many of her writings included themes of abolition and voting rights and intersectional identity. She used her powers of rhetoric to teach and to lecture across the country on these issues, inspiring those who shared her values and persuading those who didn't. And though to my knowledge, she didn't write much about the Unitarian side of her faith. And so we don't know a ton about what drew her to this religious tradition alongside the AME faith of her childhood. But what I have long suspected is that in addition to surely resonating with the theology and the values of the congregation and the preaching of Reverend Dr. William Henry Furness and then Reverend Joseph May and others, that this was a place of power. Powerful people, leaders in industry and in railroads, this was a place that centered its values, not just private religious values, but public religious values of creating a more just world. And though there were surely many reasons why she chose to make her place this home, one of them was that being a member of this congregation helped her be a more effective change maker in the wider world. Like us, she found that through her own personal spiritual renewal and her connections to the others here and the clergy who were helping make the world a better place, this place made her a more effective change maker. 
Frances Ellen Watkins Harper spent her life giving to others and giving to justice movements that helped gain civil rights for black people and for women. She gave because someone gave to her. Because her aunt and uncle who raised her gave her an education and opened their home to her and their organizing to her that the AME Church of her childhood gave to her, empowered her, that this Unitarian Church bolstered her power to make change. She gave because others gave to her. And she gave because nobody gave to her, because she lost both parents by the time she was three. Because though she was born free by her mid-twenties, her home state said that she should be a slave. Because she had to fight tooth and nail for a place for women in the voting rights movement that was centering black men and tooth and nail for a place for black people in the voting rights women, movement that centered white women. She gave because someone gave to her and because nobody gave to her. But in her giving, she created a legacy in this world of freedom. Her giving helped to create the right, of, the right to vote, not just for one oppressed group or another oppressed group, but for all people. Her giving of herself to this place built multicultural community in this congregation and continues to be inspiration for over the, I don't know, 150 years of Unitarians and Unitarian Universalists of color who see, who see themselves in her legacy here and who have found a home in this faith, not to mention those of us who are white. She said, we are all bound up together in one great bundle of humanity and society cannot trample on the weakest and feeblest of its members without receiving the curse in its own soul. And as John B. in the band sang in the words of you two this morning, which by the way, I don't know if anyone else feels like this, but I feel like we should claim you two as like ours because it's like another way of saying two yous or Unitarian Universalist. So maybe more you two, John B., you know, I can figure that out. As they sing, one life, but we're not the same. We get to carry each other. We get to carry each other. We give because someone gave to us. We give because no one gave to us. We give because giving changed us or it could have changed us. And you gave me what you did not have, and I gave you what I had to give, and together, together we made something greater from the difference. My friends, may we give because it changed us, or it could have changed us. May we give because someone or nobody gave to us. And more than anything else, may, we give, may what we give make something greater from the difference. May it be so, and amen. Hi, I'm Reverend Hannah Capaldi. And I'm Reverend Abby Tennis. We are the ministers at the First Unitarian Church of Philadelphia, where our mission is to awaken love and justice in our lives and in the world. We're so grateful that you watched, and we hope that the sermon connected with your soul. We also want to invite you to join us for a live worship service every Sunday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. You can always find the link to that service on our website at www.philauu.org. In these services, you'll hear words like you've just heard, and you also get a chance to greet one another, pray together, sing together, and we even hold a virtual coffee hour after services to get a chance to greet some new and old friends. If you want to support the mission of this community and you feel moved to give, you can do so by going to the website that Reverend Abby just mentioned. You can find that link below, or you can text 215-709-5095 and follow the prompts to give. If someone in your life needs to hear these words today, we encourage you to share this video. And again, thank you so much for watching. We hope to see you soon.